I'm um, happy to see you. I assume that you're here because we share an interest in Eleanor Roosevelt. Would that be correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I have pretty much read most of what is what she wrote over over the years, and I find her to be a very inspiring historical figure. In fact, one of my favorites. Um, let me just say that I'm not going to have a PowerPoint. I'm just going to speak, and I hope that you'll be able to follow. I'll kind of do it uh, slowly and in, in, in such a way. I mean, you're all Stanford alumni, so there should not be any problem. But I'm just going to go over kind of an outline of what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, start with her childhood, her early life. Um, then I'll do, so, so I'll do half biography, kind of, and half analysis. And then I'm going to talk about her marriage and family. Um, then two great crises that shaped the rest of her life. Um, then her, what I call, feminist education in the 1920s after these two crises. The two crises are um, the 1918 discovery of FDR's affair with Lucy Mercer, and the second is uh, FDR's polio. Um, so it's interesting also that the crises are about him. Um, but nonetheless, that's the way her biography was, her life was really shaped. Um, it's, I, I think that's a valid um, point. Then in the 1920s, a feminist education, which I think was transforming. And then um, FDR's election as president, 1933, um, ER as first lady. Um, and then her role in the 1940s during World War II. Franklin's death in 1945. Then she has a new career, um, which I call On the World Stage. Um, and then I'll try and do a summary of her uniqueness um, and how she was, as I, th I think she was, a transformative figure and certainly a transformative first lady. Um, she broke the mold. And there has not been a first lady like her before or since, um, in, in, in my view. So here are two, two questions. One question is, how did Eleanor Roosevelt overcome personal struggles to become, that is, um, her own psychological and personal struggles, which I'll describe from her childhood, and become the transformative person and first lady that she was? And two, um, in what ways was she transformational um, that is ahead of her times? Um, and so those are the two questions to keep, keep in mind. Uh, so as I begin, I want to say that, as we just said, you have an interest. I have an interest. I admire Eleanor Roosevelt. She, not everybody admired her. She uh, provoked enormous controversy in her day. And here are two, two quotes. Um, one is, quote, we have already had a woman in the White House. Everybody knows she was president. That's why he was called Franklin Delano, as in Eleanor <laughs> Roosevelt. Um, and the second quote is, you could never invite her to dinner. You would never know quite who she would bring, blacks, Jews, rude, communists. It was very unsettling. So wherever she went, um, she, she provoked controversy. And I'll, I'll say something about um, her, her, she wrote about that. She responded um, in, in, in her memoirs to, to this criticism. As you might know, she was born into great privilege. So I describe her childhood as a privileged but sad girlhood. She was born in 1884 into a family of great wealth uh, and status on both sides, uh, both her parents' sides. Um, her, but her childhood was filled with sadness and loss. Her father, Elliot Roosevelt, who was the youngest brother of Theodore Roosevelt, President Theodore Roosevelt, was an alcoholic. Um, but he was a loving father to her, and she adored him. Her mother, Anna Livingston Ludlow Hall, was very beautiful and considered, she was a socialite. She considered beauty most important and manners um, more important than feelings. 
And the, the couple, Anna and Elliot Roosevelt, had th three children. Um, two boys were born after Eleanor. Elliot um, was born in 1889, uh, but he died in 1893. And another brother, Hall, was born in 1891 and lived till 1941. So what happened, so here's the family as it began. Um, her mother, Anna, died of diphtheria in 1892 when Eleanor was just eight. And her father died two years later. So um, she lost her parents by the time she was 10. She was then, from that point, raised by an aunt on her mother's side and also her grandmother Hall, her grandmother on her mother's side. Eleanor described her childhood as full of fear. Fear of the dark, fear of dogs, horses, snakes, fear of other children. She was also afraid, these are her words, of being scolded and afraid that other people would, she said, would not like me. She spoke of an intense sense of inferiority that was almost overpowering, um, coupled with an intent, that, with, a, with an um, unquenchable craving for praise and affection. Her relationship, short though it was, you know, uh, so we're, we can do a little psycho, what's, what used to be called psychohistory, right, and think about the importance of uh, childhood relationships on the rest of one's, one's life. Um, her relationships with, with each of her parents could not have been more different. She described her mother as, quote, the most beautiful woman she ever knew, but her mother also represented coldness, severity, and disapproval. Um, and in fact, um, Eleanor was a sad, or sad and serious um, little girl. And for this, um, her mother called her granny, um, which Eleanor reported in her, in her memoirs, and, and uh, this humiliated her. By contrast, her father embodied everything that was loving and happy and warm and joyous in her childhood. So from her mother, Eleanor received the impression that she was plain, actually to the point of ugliness. And again, she was called granny for being serious, but her mother also valued beauty, and she was su supposedly not a great beauty. Um, however, in her father's eyes, um, she was. He praised her looks, uh, um, and he called her his little golden um, his, golden, her, his golden girl, um, and she remembered, this is how she remembered her father. My father was always devoted to me. However, as soon as I could talk, I went to his dressing room every morning and I chatted with him. Uh, I even danced for him, intoxicated by the, poor, the pure joy of motion, tr twisting round and round until he would pick me up and throw me into the air and, and, and tell me that I made him dizzy. So the however is not a big point. Um, so he was always devoted to her, and she, in turn, adored him. Um, so this is what I would call kind of precur these are precursors of what follows. Um, her, her mother's role right, and the early loss of both parents paved the way for, for her kind of inward turning, depressive, and moody personality. And on the other hand, um, looking for sources in her childhood of, of strength, right, and self-esteem, right, we can see her father's love, which, which um, you know, it's hard to say if it balanced out um, her mother's severity, but, but um, his love and affirmation um, was primary um, in, in terms of her, her growing personality. So for a moment, I want to put her childhood years um, into history. Right, she grew up. Eleanor Roosevelt grew up in the 1890s, um, which uh, and then then the turn of the 20th century. These are years of late Victorian culture in the United States, um, and the beginnings of the Progressive Reform Movement, which 
Anyone you might remember from history? Um, this was a time it was particularly focused on urban reform and on um, uh, working with large numbers of new immigrants and, and their adjustment to, to the United States. Um, it was also the, these were also the years that the first generation of women graduated from college. Um, and Eleanor grew up pretty much. Uh, very much outside of this kind of vanguard of what was to become the new woman um, who emerged a little bit later. Um, she did not go to college, um, and she grew up in kind of insular in, in her family and in high society, the society of the Holes and the Roosevelts. Um, also, while, while she was growing up, the women's suffrage movement was intensely focused on its home stretch towards gaining the vote, uh, the 19th Amendment, which was passed in 1920. So the next important stage in her life was that she was sent by her uh, grandmother and aunt to a what we would call a finishing school in England, which was the Allenswood School. Allenswood School. She was sent there when she was 15 in 1899, and she was there for three years. And this was another a very positive and very important experience. And it also, as I describe this, you can think about you know, who she was to garner this kind of attention. So basically, the headmistress at the Allenswood School, who was herself a very, um, uh, quite a figure, very bright and cultured, um, her name was Marie Souvestre. Uh, she singled, uh, she used to have favorites, and she singled out Eleanor as her favorite amongst the favorites. So she, Eleanor was selected to sit next to Madame Souvestre at dinner. And she um, had the privilege of traveling with her to, to Paris over Christmas. And in fact, they traveled all over Europe in those three years and the Mediterranean. Um, and at the same time, she was, Eleanor was a very good student. Um, so there was ac some academic, um, there was certainly an academic curriculum uh, at, at this uh, girl's finishing school. And um, Eleanor was also very popular amongst the other girls at the finishing school. Um, another student, has another student, as another student described it, um, at Allenswood, ER was everything. Um, and she, Eleanor, ex uh, cherished this experience, her experience at Allenswood throughout her life. And so this is interesting. She had her letters from uh, Madame Sylvestre um, with her um, next to her le the few letters she had from her father. So she, she identified both of these relationships um, as a source of great um, strength and love for her as she was growing up. Uh, so this was um, an affirm, these are both affirming counterbalances, it seems to me, to her grim um, and to the loss of her parents and the grimness and negativity from her mother. Eleanor's aunts uh, wanted her to return back to New York um, in 1901 for her society debut, which was at the Waldorf Astoria, Astoria Hotel in, in New York. Um, and so here she, grows as a New York debutante, as befitting um, her family uh, lineage. Um, and in the years following her coming out party, um, this is significant, she became a bit involved, although through her society connections, that is through the Junior League of New York, she became involved um, in progressivism, in the progressive reform movement. And uh, for example, through the Junior League, she taught um, calisthenics exercise um, and dancing to immigrant girls. Um, and then even a bit more political, she joined the Consumers League um, and she personally began to investigate working conditions amongst New York's women garment workers. So we start to see her kind of moving out, right, of this um, elite um, society girl uh, circle and the emergence of what becomes a social conscience in her. So now I'm going to turn to marriage and family. Eleanor met 
Franklin Delano Roosevelt, that's how you really say it, um, uh, in 1903 at a family picnic. He was her fifth cousin once removed, um, a distant cousin. And um, apparently they immediately liked one another. So, you know, she had the self esteem and the wherewithal to respond to him, right? And to, and to respond to his um, courtship. And they had, um, by all accounts, a rollicking, frolicking, romantic courtship. And they became engaged in 1904 and married in 1905. Her uncle, then President Theodore Roosevelt, gave her away at her wedding. Then between, so then children follow right away between 1906 and 1916. She gave birth to six children. One of them um, was a son who um, died soon after birth. Um, so they had five children who grew to adulthood. Um, notable in those years, she, it, it seems that she had some uh, postpartum depression. Um, and notable among, uh, you know, in her marriage and in um, the early years of, of childbearing um, is her relationship with Franklin's mother, Sarah. Um, Sarah was, on the one hand, quite overbearing and intrusive. Um, in fact, Sarah bought um, Franklin and Eleanor a townhouse on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and she bought the one next door, and, and she built a kind of um, a connection. Uh, well, she broke through the walls on each side, and so you could just walk from one house to the other. So that you know makes, in, phys in physical terms, um, her, intrus her intrusiveness. Um, on the other hand, I, I want you to know um, that there, the, the relationship with Sarah was quite complicated. She also helped Eleanor. And, and here's a kind of interesting uh, story. And, and that is that it, it looks like Eleanor withdrew when her first children were born. Um, she found it kind of difficult to take care of the children. Uh, you know, of course, she had other um, um, servants helping her. Um, but uh, Sarah intervened and helped her. Um, and she, so Eleanor said, um, I, I never had any interest um, in dolls or in little children. And I absolutely knew nothing about the handling or feeding of a little baby. But um, Sarah um, actually was never critical of her mothering and helped her um, and wrote, baby is lovely, Eleanor is bright and well. And so um, I, I you know, sort of think it was a complicated relationship, but it also had its good, you know, it, she also um, had uh, a positive, um, played a positive role in Eleanor's life. Um, so what I want to now say is then in 1918, so actually in um, 19, uh, six, so at the meantime, Eleanor's having children, she's bearing these children, and Franklin's career is, is rising, right? He, um, in, during World War I in 1916, he's appointed assistant secretary of the Navy. Um, and what happens is in 1918, um, uh, in Campobello, Maine, and he, he goes sailing, and he takes a dip in the water, which is cold water, and he gets, um, um, he contracts polio. Um, and is paralyzed. And um, wait, I have to back up. Before I, I'm doing um, the, the second crisis, that's in, um, in, in 1921. So wait, what happens is, so his career rises, and um, Eleanor hires a social secretary for herself, um, and that is a woman named Lucy Mercer. And Lucy Mercer, um, establishes a relationship with Franklin, and in 1918, right, and this is in the early stages of her marriage after she has these children and she was struggling with postpartum depression, etc. cetera, um, she discovers letters, love letters, um, which apparently he didn't hide very deliberately, so maybe he wanted her to know. So she discovers in 1918 that he's having an affair with her social secretary. And this was devastating to her, and she wrote quite a bit about this. You know, she felt that her whole world caved in, and she wanted to divorce him. 
And it's Sarah, his mother, who had great ambitions for her son Franklin, political ambitions, and she opposed that. Um, and you know, they um, had to accept that. I mean, one thing, uh, it, you know, it's kind of hard to analyze, but one thing is Sarah held lots of purse strings uh, for them. Um, you know, they, she, Eleanor had her own family wealth, and so did uh, Franklin, but Sarah was paying for a lot um, uh, for this um, couple, even though Franklin was rising um, in public positions. So she stays with Franklin, and she's quite withdrawn. There are photographs of her looking quite depressed um, after in, in um, 1919 and 1920. And the next thing that happens, is what I was referring to uh, before, is that in 1921, right, he contracts polio. So, right, so here you have this woman who has been devastated by this revelation of his uh, infidelity, his affair, um, and she's staying with him, and then he's paralyzed. And the way I would like to present that, this to you is that what happens is they forge a quite um, unique marriage coming from both of those crises f with full awareness um, of you know, his other relationship, right? Lucy Mercer stayed in their lives, which is, which is quite interesting. Um, and so what happens is that a, a ne the next stage, which I call Eleanor's feminist education in the 1920s. Um, and um, I was referring before to, you know, the kind of uh, first generation of women who went to, graduated from college, Right, um, and then by 1920, there's the emergence of what historians call the new woman, um, who is both, uh, you know, the sort of the ro roaring 20s, and we have the flapper, kind of a more independent woman, and also um, um, a, a woman who's seriously involved in social reform. And Eleanor makes friends with a circle of progressive social reformer women. Um, in New York, and they, she gets an apartment in Greenwich Village. She gets her own apartment in Greenwich Village, um, and these are women such as um, Nancy Cook, um, Molly Dusen, um, more famous women, Jane Addams of Hull House, um, Florence Kelly of the National Consumers League, um, suffrage leaders, um, uh, Carrie Chapman Catt and Alice Paul, very um, bright activist women. Um, so this is a circle of what I call social feminists, and um, Eleanor started to have a great time. And in 1925, uh, um, she asked, I guess, it's hard to say. Either Franklin built this for her, or she asked Franklin. In any event, you know, they had they lived in Hyde Park, New York, um, and Franklin built her her own home, her own estate, which is called Val Kill. So she had her own apartment in Greenwich Village, and then she has her own home in in Hyde Park. And Val Kill was a center for women activists. There was also a furniture factory at Val Kill, where, which employed women um, making furniture, and then they would sell it, and so that would help um, some young women get gain a livelihood. Um, and they established a school for girls called the Todd Hunter School, where Eleanor taught in the 1920s. So what I'm suggesting here is that um, there was this kind of transforming education for Eleanor. Um, it seems to me from her papers, there's no question that she was either at Allenswood or along the way quite well educated, uh, quite articulate, quite understanding of, of current, the current political uh, situation. Um, and you know, this kind of gave her, um, it seems to me, a um, new identity. Uh, fr from this experience. This is how she emerges, it seems to me, from these crises. So now I want to uh, move forward to the 1930s, the Great Depression, and the election of Franklin 
1933, so this makes Eleanor Roosevelt first lady. And I can't say enough um, about how uh, unique she was as a first lady and how um, very much ahead of her time she was. And here it's important to note that this is the this is, this is a result of their partnership, the unique partnership that Eleanor and Franklin forged um, for themselves. And in part, he, he wanted her to be his eyes and ears and legs also. And he encouraged her to go investigate conditions um, around the country and to report back. And she had a, a, you know, tremendous license and leeway that he gave her and um, welcomed it. And she would put notes um, in a box in, you know, for him, um, which he would read. And, and she, you know, she, that, that's the way she would give him her advice. So I want to, um, you know, so in, in, in the, I'll, I'll summarize this, but in, just in terms of how visible she was and how many issues she cared about, right? She's first lady, and and um, he he's a, you know a quite great leader as as president, right? But he's faced with a depression, right? The Great Depression. That's when he um, takes office, and. Um, you know, so she gets right out there, and she's um, she has a newspaper column, right, which is called My Day. She takes special interest in how women are are dealing with the with the Great Depression, um, and so she has she forges a public role for herself, right. She's very visible as a first lady. So let me just um, summarize um, a couple of issues that were important to her, and you can also see how ahead of her time she was. Um, the first is civil rights uh, that I want to talk about. Um, she believed, so this is during the 30s, she believed that um, discrimination was a moral issue. Um, and um, she worked for the employment, uh, she, she worked for equality for, for blacks during the 1930s. Um, she um, famously um, integrated a, um, an event where she, which she attended, um, I believe it was in Georgia, and there, the seating was whites here and blacks there, and she went over and she sat on the black side. Um, if, if you don't know that, that that's the kind of thing she, she did. Um, she pro proposed um, a federal anti-lynching bill in 1934, um, and um, she lobbied, uh, so she proposed this and she lobbied FDR, although it never came up uh, for a vote. Um, it was not, the time was not ripe. She was ahead of, uh, of her time there. Um, she herself, um, and this is quite famous, she resigned. She was a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution, the DAR, right? She resigned from the DAR in 1939 when they denied uh, the uh, black singer Marian Anderson um, the, the access to, um, she was supposed to sing at Constitution Hall, so the DAR said no because we don't have blacks singing there. Um, and of course she goes and sings at Lincoln Memorial, um, which is a wonderful um, historic um, um, event. Um, and right, so, so uh, she says that, here, I think here's, a, I have a quote. Um, anyway, she resigned because she did, she said she disapproves of that action, so she has n no other uh, course than to, to, therefore I resign, she says. Um, uh, during the Depression, um, she was very much um, outspokenly concerned with the issue of severe poverty in, and unemployment in general, and in particular in, Appala in Appalachia. Um, she um, promoted the establishment of a, a subsistence farming project, which was called Arthurdale in West Virginia. Um, and it was part of the uh, Farmstead Division of the um, I Industrial Recovery Act. <clears throat> um, and so the government invested um, in buying land and houses um, and acquiring livestock um, and farm machines uh, for homesteaders for over 30 years. Um, apparently, though, 
um, so, so she was completely behind this. This was her project. Arthurdale was her project. But apparently, um, there, it was too expensive, and there were <clears throat> fiscal blunders, and um, it, was a bit of, it was a bit of a failure. But it was none, nonetheless, um, it seems to me, an important um, experiment in terms of helping the, the plot. The, the lot of, of the poor farmers in, in Appalachia. Um, she was very much in favor of, the, uh, of jobs for youth, um, the, the fact that there was going to be um, a, an, uh, you know, a, the young generation who, were, um, who had no opportunities for employment. Um, so she was um, uh, an advocate of the um, National Youth Administration. Um, and that was. In, so in 1935, um, as you know, there is what's called the New Deal legislation, which comes from the Depression, um, and is, is really a landmark set of um, programs expanding the role of the federal government in social welfare. And she was an activist behind this, very, very importantly behind this. Um, and um, you know, so so the New Deal brings about the National Youth Administration, the Works Progress Administration, um, to put people to work. That is right. The government, the federal government, puts people to work, um, and she kind of set a standard. Um, so um, then, so she's an activist first lady, um, and then um, FDR. Um, and, and she, and, and then, and then there, the United States gets involved in the Second World War. She goes um, to Japan and she um, um, greets to, to greet the troops. She tr she started to travel all all over the world, um, in in at a time when that was qu you know quite extraordinary, quite quite unusual, um, and um, so she, so he he dies um, in 1941. Right, and um, she lives on until 1962, and she has a huge. Sorry. Sorry, 45. Right, 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 right. Right, I have that on there, and I have. Okay, sorry, 45. I'm I'm um, getting rid of him too quickly, um, so so yeah so uh, apologies two apologies, um, okay so um, he dies in in 1945, and she in fact um, has so here's an, another um, sort of more intimate. Um, um, vignette in terms of um, his death. Lucy Mercer was with him. He died in Warm Springs, Georgia, which was a place where he went. Um, it was a, a place where he could um, um, get treatment for, for polio. And he, there was a, a pool that he s could swim in. And it was a place that he liked to retreat. Um, and um, she, she, so he was, um, Lucy Mercer accompanied him there. And Eleanor was told that, that um, you know, he was, he was very, very ill and she didn't make it, and it kind of um, hurt her deeply that, that um, Lucy Mercer was with him and, and she wasn't with him. So you know, he had this relationship with her, with Lucy Mercer, through, through all of these years and through all of um, Eleanor's achievements. Um, and so as far as on the world stage, right, um, Eleanor then goes on to be an advocate for human rights, and she's the first um, UN delegate. Uh, first uh, U.S. delegate to the United Nations, um, and she's one of the um, architects of the um, International Declaration of, for Human Rights, and then she talks throughout the world um, about the importance of human rights and also the role of the United Nations. Um, and um, she was a strong supporter moving forward um, of John Kennedy's um, candidacy for president, um, and then he appointed her head of a of his commission on women. And uh, then, she, so she's active, right to the end of her life. And I will say this accurately: she she dies at the age of seventy eight. She dies of tuberculosis in nineteen sixty two. So, what I want to do. So that's her biography with sort of um, my take kind of on what ha on, 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 on her life in, in a kind of in a nutshell. I mean, this is there's, a, you know, a, as I said, a huge amount of literature um, about her. I want to just kind of in summary give you some uh, uh, thoughts about 
uh, how unique she was, in what ways she was unique. So first, she had a, um, I think, extraordinary and unique marriage after Franklin's affair. Um, it was a relationship that was, you know, theirs alone, right? Um, and, and you know, we don't know what went on, but there's um, lots of evidence, lots of writing that there was a great deal of affection between them. Um, that they each had their own lives. That's how it seems, right? But then they also came together and enjoyed each other and supported each other in our in our you know terms. They they managed that this managed as you know to work for them. So that's the first thing. Um, she found a circle of, an, kind of an inner circle of close friends who satisfied her emotional needs beyond Franklin, right? And um, several, she had several intimate friends, right? And, you know, she um, may have had both male and female lovers. There's um, records of, of very um, affectionate and passionate writings. Um, and and um, there is um, one particular man um, who taught her how to, uh, she used to ride horses with. Um, he apparently taught her how to drive. Um, she, Earl, his name is Earl Miller. And so he, you know, they may have had an attraction. Uh, you know, she wrote affectionately to many men. Um, she was um, um, a very passionate person who established close relationships. Um, and, and also some of these intimate friends also became her political advisors. So um, building on this kind of inner circle of close friends, um, she educated herself on social issues of the time um, and on political issues. Um, and this enabled her to pursue her own agenda um, on behalf of women um, in the 1920s um, and then during the Depression on behalf of the poor and blacks. Um, and all laboring men and women during the New Deal in the 1930s. Then as a first lady, um, I think there's no question that she was the most independent, outspoken, and influential first lady in history. Uh, and perhaps because of FDR's paralysis um, and also the great, he had an enormous respect for her because of his respect for, for Eleanor. Um, he relied on her um, as perhaps his closest advisor. Um, and again, he asked her to be his eyes and ears and legs. She was able to also publicly be critical of FDR's agenda. Um, he's quoted as saying, I can't do a thing about her. Right, that's the quote. They would say, didn't uh, Eleanor say, blah, blah, you know, Mrs. Roosevelt said such and such, and that, that, that's what he would say. Um, and um, here's another, another example. There was, uh, in 1933, there was um, a, one of um, FDR's uh, pieces of New Deal legislation was called the Economy Act, which was going to fire employed um, the wives who were employed, whose husbands were federal workers, right? So in other words, they were seen as superfluous workers if their husbands were working, right? And so she thought this was a terrible thing. And she was quoted in the New York Times saying, quote, it is a very bad and foolish thing to establish marital status as a standard for dismissal. So she failed um, to get a change she, this, this, this legislation apparently passed. Um, and I, I can say as an aside, that's part of the fact that you know, the economy was based on a single wage earner, right? A single, the male breadwinner, right? So that's why women you know, had a hard time getting good jobs, especially during the Depression. Uh, so she had unique access uh, to Franklin, um, and he welcomed and respected it. And I think that that's ex exceptional. Um, I mean, if you, we could t talk about this, but it's, um, so there's Hillary Clinton. I mean, maybe that's what you're thinking of by now, but, but um, you know, but a very different case. So then um, the fifth point in terms of her, her uniqueness is that after FDR's death, she then has her own independent, influential public career, right, as an international ambassador for human rights. 
Um, again, as I said, um, she was the United States' first delegate to the United Nations, and she traveled all over the world, and she was an out, quite an articulate spokesman uh, for, for human rights and the idea that the World War II was going to transform um, the, the um, international um, uh, arena, the diplomatic arena. So finally, um, how was she transformational? So this was the, how she was unique, and now how was she transformational? Um, I believe she really did have a transforming impact on many major events of her time. Um, and notably, she, um, so this is very important in light of the legislation that I just described, firing um, the wives of um, federal workers. She, she advocated and succeeded in getting specific employment programs for women, other employment programs for women during the Depression. Um, she was a strong um, proponent of labor unions um, and a strong, a staunch supporter of civil rights. Um, and in terms of the ma major um, political shifts that occurred in the New Deal, right, which was the expansion of the government's role in social welfare, um, she was an outspoken supporter of this, that it's, the, that it's the responsibility of the federal government, right? So historically, there has been great tension, and um, there, you, you see this in the newspaper every day, right? What's the role of the federal government in terms of health, right? Just um, to, to pick something um, <laughs> of, of current concern. Um, and, and so, you know, she spoke out um, that the government should be involved in health care, in child care programs, um, and in aid for um, what was originally welfare, which is aid for needy families. So um, such efforts were very controversial um, in the 1930s, um, as, as you might know. Um, and you know, as a, a final point, um, she was in fact the alone. She was really the only woman on the public stage in those years. It was just Eleanor Roosevelt, right? She got, I think she was very influential in Frances Perkins being um, um, appointed the first woman in the cabinet. She was Secretary of Labor under F F FDR, but she was not as outspoken um, as, as Eleanor Roosevelt. So in something of a nutshell, that is what I wanted to present to you about Eleanor Roosevelt as a transformative uh, person. And, and I guess the final point I can make is that, you know, I described um, a bit about her childhood. And it, it just seems to me that she was able to over, you know, she did suffer from depression um, at many junctures, but she was able to, to pull through. Um, and there are many quotes that um, I find inspiring. And one of them is she said, you must always do the thing you cannot do, right? And it, it seems to me that she faced lots of moments when it was hard to carry on, and, and that, that's exactly what she did. So I'm happy to um, uh, um, hear questions, try and answer questions. Thanks for coming. Yes? How would you compare Eleanor Roosevelt and Hillary Clinton? Yeah, that's an, a good and obvious comparison. So I would say that she, that they're similar. And um, Hillary Clinton admires Eleanor Roosevelt um, greatly. And so what I would say is that it's a different, it was a different e era, right, in the 90s when Bill Clinton was president, right? She, uh, Hillary Clinton is a professional. She's every bit his equal. Um, and in, in some ways, you know, um, Eleanor had the had the public stage in ways when Hillary was first lady, it seems that she wa was told she was overstepping. Like, it, like for example, in the, you know, the fir their first administration, she was the head of a committee to, um, uh, for health care reform. You recall that, and um, apparently she bought, she was seen as just too outspoken, and he was told, "Don't let her do this." And and first ladies since then, right, have been a little bit more demure, right? In, in, in you know, the, you know, sort of um, having um, non-controversial issues, 
right? So there are certainly parallels in terms of how articulate um, Hillary is, but as a first lady, um, she had to kind of step back and have more neutral issues. She wasn't going to be this kind of outspoken leader. That then, and that's an, kind of an interesting contrast if you think about the difference between the 1930s and the 1990s. But there's you know much more you know to say about that. Um, thanks. As a mother, it's a very good question. Um, okay, so I've read, um, you know, writings that her children have have written. So she, you know, as time went on, she was a kind of um, classic, um, you know, a wealthy. She was a society woman, and other women did the, you know, kind of work of mothering for her, um, but. You know, as time went on, her children were very supportive in these crises, very, very supportive, and she did have, um, you know, close relationships. You know, she um, had, you know, they had all kinds of divorces. Her children had all kinds of divorces and disappointments and ups and downs, and she, you know, was, you know, kind of deeply concerned. So there was no estrangement. Um, so that's a kind of bit of a complicated assessment. I, I would give her OK. <laughs> yeah? Did you ever go up to their house? For, In Hyde Park? Yes. Yeah. And saw her house. Yeah. The thing that struck me about her there was that really all she cared about was getting people together to talk. Yes. And you saw more chairs than anything else in that house. She had beautiful silverware and all that, but that was all pushed on the sideboard. And that she, they told us that the menus, she had no idea of how to balance a meal or, you know, she had very heavy food and dessert would be multi layer pancakes that she had to cut through and all that. But the main thing was that people would get together and exchange ideas. And then one time I did see her in, we live in Washington, and huh. she was sitting, uh, she was giving a lecture. And she looked like a birthday cake. The light was shining on her hair, and her eyes, her glasses were sparkling. She was just lovely. There was an article speaking of food. Um, so that's a wonderful point that she brought people together, and that was that was what she was. She was, a, you know, a, a people person who brought, brought brought people together. But there was an article in the New Yorker several years ago about the, her cook and, and, and her menus, and it was apparently terrible, terrible food. So, right, we can't give her very high marks for that. So, who, yeah. How was she viewed by the press? Right, as I started, you know, so so this was kind of, this is a kind of internal view of kind of who, of who she was. Um, many people hated her and thought she was, you know, completely um, um, overstepping her role, right? And, you know, and certainly, um, you know, political enemies of, of, of you know, of, of Franklin, but um, it didn't stop her. Um, so it's a, it's a really good question. You can read a lot about what people thought. And, you know, they thought she had no, just too outspoken and she had no business, um, you know, saying what she did. And, and so, so um, here's what she's, is, is, I, I can quote a little bit of this. She basically wrote about, um, on criticism. She has a, a, a little piece about this. Um, and she basically says, you'll be damned if you do and damned if you don't, so say what you think. Right, you're going to get. She said, "You're going to get criticized anyway," um, and um, you know that's what she thought. She said, "Many people don't think she should be doing what she's doing, um, but she thinks that um, it's important to speak, speak out, and say what you believe." Yes. Oh, after that, I um, there are letters between the two of them, um, uh, and you know, I don't know what what she did after that, but they there are letters of condolence um, between the two of them. Mm -hmm. Pretty, yeah. There was not, there was not, you know, there's a kind of some kind of um, uh, I don't know how to put it, accommodation, painful accommodation on Eleanor's part, probably. Yeah. Um, so maybe. Affair, yeah. 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 Um, at least Lucy Mercer, if not others. Um, and maybe I should also say there, it was not so unusual. I think what was unusual is how public, you know, and how, how Eleanor knew, um, you know, among presidents. 
Yes. Was, was the uh, affair he had with Lucy Mercer um, well known among the press for, and that that was just an era when that wasn't reported? Wasn't. Was it wasn't actually a secret. It was a, it was a secret. It was it was known among their amongst you know the, the, the in, within the family, and so that's another contrast in terms of the '90s and the you know the '20s and '30s. There's a kind of um, insulation, you know, and uh, a um, uh, realm of privacy um, that was possible that's not possible with media now. Um, I don't know if you were getting at that, but I think that's an important difference. Um, it was possible not to have that known, right? It was possible to have sec respectable secrets. Yes? Uh, I grew up in a household with a grandmother who was uh, uh, the same social environment, about four years older than Eleanor, uh, and traveled in kind of the same circles. And uh, what was, and was very political and violently opposed to her, but um, what was the, do you have a clue as to what was the Yeah, yeah, and well, I think there was a lot, you know, so the Roosevelt's were Democrats, right? And, um, you know, the, I said, what I, the only evidence I gave you is, right, she, the Junior League is the, or, you know, the, the uh, society girls, right? And they're going out um, and they're working in settlement houses, right? So um, I think there were, I, I don't think there were, um, Many other uh, wealthy women and men, right, in the 1910s, 19 teens, right, who went to Greenwich Village and, or, or, or you know, who even, you know, you know, were, you know, fought um, overseas, and right, were so, you know, so she's not the only one, um, and I think the, you know, the issue is that she develops the social conscience, I think, through learning about the, and 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 you know, physically seeing the plight of poor people, and maybe it was because uh, you know of her own vulnerabilities. Um, and, you know, coming, for, you know, uh, having the, the mother that she had and kind of trying to put things together. And so, um, you know, if you think that she's, a, you know, to put it as traitor to her class, you, you know, is one way to put it. I think you could say that she comes from a privileged family that has, and she develops a strong social conscience and concern for social justice, and she's not the only one. And the circle of women who are her friends, they're very wealthy women. I mean, they're not Roosevelt's. Um, but, um, and that, it's a really interesting question. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, always looking for clues about that, but it's her experience and she is, to, you know, she goes and, and, and sees the garment workers and she's just tremendously moved. You know, it's the, you know, it's her response to that. It was a, it was a collective She's not the only one. No, 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 no. Single incident. Oh. Yeah, I think so. Cumulative, uh, cumulative experiences. Yeah. As part of her social conscience, consciousness, didn't she visit the Japanese internment Yes, she did. Yes. But she couldn't change anything in, in, you know, in terms of that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and another point is that she is more conservative in her early years, right? And and um, you know it's probably you know after World War One that she you know starts to be much more critical, um, and you know so it's an evolution, really, you know, kind of a kind of education. Yeah. Any other great great questions? It's great to hear from the alumni. So, okay, so. Have a good rest of your reunion.